Truth Annual Worship Conference. Our speakers this year include Pastor Mark Warbo from Port Huron, Michigan, and Pastors Tony and Cheryl Ashmore from Atlanta, Georgia, as well as pastors and teachers from BC2. We hope you enjoy. We love y'all. We love this church. We love, we love what we're seeing you do in your city. Uh, congratulations on your land purchase. Excited about that. So, so every one of you should be believing. I, I want to tell you because we just went through a, a, a building capital campaign program, building program, and, and here's what here's what God's asking you to do, and you need and you need to step out there. God will bring the money you need to put the building he wants on that property, but he's going to bring it through you. And what you've got to do, and, and we did this thing, our, our whole thing, we just finished. We, in fact, Cheryl, was, we were just celebrating because we just got the CO text that we got the final permanent certificate of occupancy on the new uh, building. And so, well, and, uh, and so we had this thing called Forward. And what we challenged people to do, so we were looking for, the Lord had challenged me, he said, find 300 people who will commit to give at least $3,000 a year above their normal tithes and offerings. And, and a lot of people, I noticed, you know, there weren't a whole lot of people committing to begin with. And, and, and the thing, I, a lot of times, is what we're doing is we're afraid to commit until we have it. And what God was saying was, commit and I'll bring it. Is, is it there's this whole thing of commitment and we've become a people who are afraid of commitment. It's why we don't get married. It's why we, you know, we practice marriage, and or actually we're practicing divorce. The uh, uh, instead of getting married and and all those things, because we're afraid of commitment. And the Lord just said, "Hey, commit to it and see what I'll do." And I, I just want to challenge you. If you're a a VC tour here tonight, I'm talking to you. Okay, is God will bring in the million plus you're going to need to do what he wants to do on that property but you're going to have to step out there and and and, and here's a, a simple practical way is you know we give online Cheryl and I, I believe you ought to automate the important and so we give online so that way when we're on vacation or whatever our church we still bless them but the uh and so we, and we believe in tithing and giving big time uh and but one day, a few years ago, I was standing there, and I came in. We have, we have two, like y'all, we have two celebrations on Sunday morning. And I was standing there, and, and the Lord reminded me of that verse, don't come before me empty-handed. And I said, well, I don't. You know, Lord, I sent it, you know, it's digitally <laughs> it's sent in. And he said, I know all that. And he said, but I want you to start, every time you come into my presence, bring something. Bring something. Don't come before me empty-handed. And so it would be... You know, whatever on Sunday mornings, it's whatever's in my wallet, uh, and I make sure there's something in my wallet. But it's you know, and sometimes it's a do, it's a dollar in each celebration. Sometimes it's twenty, and and uh, one one day I was I was driving to church, and I thought, you know what, all I got is a, a twenty and a ten. I need to go by the store first and break this ten. <laughs> I'm just being honest with y'all, you know. And the Lord said, Oh yeah, that's great. Just go figure out how little you can give. <laughs> Does he talk to y'all like that? I mean, he just, yeah, that's great, Tony. Just go figure out how little you can give. Because that's the way I work. I'm always figuring out how little I can save you. Instead of when I save you, I save you completely. You know? I said, okay, I got it. I got it. So, so now I don't just give something that's in my wallet every Sunday morning. I empty my wallet. You know, and, and, uh, and I just give it every Sunday morning above and beyond what we already give and what I've seen is the you you know it, the principle's true. You can't outgive the Lord. And what you do is you open up avenues for Him to bring. You're talking about going beyond your waterline. I think one of the number one things that are stopping the church and stopping people from ever going where you want to go with God is we're stingy. Is that is that God is this gracious, generous God? And you know, in the United States, what the percentage of the of the Bible believing church that is tithing? 3% today. It used to be 10%. In the 90s, it was 10%. Today, it's 3% of the church. Dave Ramsey did a study, and he said, if everybody who says they're a member of every church in America would simply start tithing, every church in America would be debt-free in 90 days. You know, all you got to do is go figure out what's the median income of your area. And, and in our area, the median income must be people are making about $800 a year.
Isn't that right, isn't that right Pastor Mark? You know what I'm talking about? And, I, and so I completely understand why they're always struggling because they only make about $800 to $1,000 a year. <laughs> and, so I, and this has nothing to do with my message. This is just, this, I'm just telling you, is God, God didn't save that property for you for 20 years for it to sit there for another 20 years, wait on, on a bunch of stingy people. And I'm not calling you stingy. I'm just saying that you're not stingy. And God is not, God, God's ready. The fact that he uncovered it and gave it to you tells you he's ready. Let's move. Okay, how's he going to move? He's going to move through you. And so and here's what, he never asks you to bring what you don't have. He asks you, will you start? Well, just give what you can. Give what you have. And I just want to challenge you. Be a tither, be a giver, and starting this week, every week, say, you know what, above and beyond our tithing and giving, we're, we're giving something toward getting that, uh, getting that land paid off and, and paying cash for a building. We just, we just the one we bit just finished, we, we paid cash for everything along the way. It was so cool to just say, now we're paying cash for it, we're paying cash for it. And it's neat. Now we're, we're almost finished. You know, the CEO's there, but we're almost finished. But we, we, don't, we didn't have to go sign a loan or, you know, we just challenged people and they did it. And I just want to challenge you. God's got big plans for you in this place. That, that piece of property, we were sitting there in front of it today. And I'm telling you, that, that thing, it's special. God's appointed it for you. And uh, step out there. Step out there. Don't wait for somebody to come bring you a million dollars. Be the one God brings it through. Amen. 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 Be that one. All right. Let's get into the word. Thank you for the, really, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's easy to love the Wallers, and it's easy, and, and, I, and I'm going to tell you something, you guys are the easiest bunch of people to be around, uh, VC2, I just, I love, Cheryl said, you've been having fun, I said, I love being here, I love teaching here, the only thing about teaching you is, is the same thing, problem I had last night, I'm standing right there saying, you know, I even emailed, you know, Tori, I said, all right, here's what I'm going to teach, I finally nailed it down, and, and I've changed it four times since I got here. <laughs> Because you guys are just so e easy to teach. And I give yourselves a hand for being so amazing. <laughs> All right. And so like I always do, give somebody a high five and tell them what? You're God's favorite. You're God's favorite. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Woo. All right. <clears throat> We've been talking, y'all been talking all week about uh, water lines, and, and I went and looked it up, and there's only one place in the Bible, it's, uh, and it's about a flood. It's when the flood in the Noah thing, you know, uh, and so I'm not going to teach on that. The, uh, <laughs> it's great, but I'm not going to teach on it. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about a place that had no water, and... And Jesus talks to us about it, and it's in the book of Revelation. Book of Revelation, chapter 3, and it's verse 13 through 16. Last night I talked some about everything you need to know is in Genesis. The whole rest of the Bible is telling you about it. And then, and then you have Revelation, and there's this amazing things about Revelation. Most of the stupid theology that's out there today, if they just read the book of Revelation, it would straighten it out. Uh, and, and by the way, God didn't give prophecy to tickle our ears. God give a, gave us prophecy to prepare us. To make us better, not for it to be something we go, ooh, that's so cool, you know, and, and, uh, and, and here's the thing I love about the uh, book of Revelation, all right, anybody got a red, red letter version, the old school version, everybody's gone digital now, but anybody got, don't you just love the fact that you hold one, and uh, it's a, all right, if you take the red letter version and you, and you scan through it, after the Gospels, after the ascension of Jesus in the book of Acts, there, there's one place where, coincidentally, where Paul quotes him, and the only red writing between uh, the, where Jesus ascends and where he starts talking again in the, is in the book of Revelation is where you find the next mass of red writing. Okay? There's only one red, red quote in there, and it's about what we just talked about. It's about giving. It's the only red quote in, from the ascension on to Revelation is, is when Paul said, Jesus said it's better to give than to receive. 
All right? And so, but then we get to Revelation, and there it is again. There's a bunch of red writing. And there's, there's a couple of things, you know, because I, I love the church. I, I really do. And I don't just love the church. I love the local church. The local church is the hope of the world. It's, it's God's plan for the world. And I meet people who, are, who claim to be in love with God, but they say, well, I love God, but I just don't like church. Well, that's like telling me, well, I, lo- I love you, Tony, but I don't like Cheryl. We're not going to hang out a lot together. <laughs> I'm just telling you, you know. Uh, God loves the local church. And, you know, people say, well, it's just, you know, I just don't. You ask people, why don't you go there? Well, I don't go there because, uh, you know, they, there's hypocrites there. Well, there's hypocrites at, at, at Kroger, and you go there. <laughs> yeah. And it's always funny to me when I say, well, all the church wants is your money, which isn't true. All God wants is your poverty. But we all go places. Anybody, anybody go to a movie? Ever go to a movie? Y'all know what they want? All they want is your money. Okay. And that doesn't offend you. Okay. And, and, uh, but book of Revelation, if you'll notice, Jesus isn't talking to the church. No, read it. He's talking to churches. He's talking to local churches. In fact, the only place... In the Bible, where Jesus is speaking after the ascension is in the local church. That's why you need to be in the local church. Because it's where Jesus is pouring, is speaking through, is the local church. It's the only place that he's speaking. And, 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 and so, I just think it's amazing. And then he gives us this great teaching. And then, talking about some of the you know, whole things about rapture and tribulation. Are we pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib? And, and the fact of the matter is... Long as long as we get to heaven, it's going to be okay, right? But but there but there really is like in Revelation, all right? He's talking about the churches, and he and he, and the churches are represented, and there's these candlesticks, and he says, you know, hey, if you don't get this straightened out, I'm going to move your candlestick out of place, all right? And so when he first starts talking to the churches in Revelation, the candlesticks are on the on the earth, and then there's this neat thing that we keep reading, and when the tribulation chapters of Revelation begin, where is the candlesticks? It's in heaven. The candlestick's no longer on the earth. So I'm, I'm a pre-trib guy. I believe the church is going to be brought out because there's the candlestick. That in Revelation, he showed uh, J- John, all right, when I began talking to the churches, the candlestick's on the earth. A little later on now, I'm going to start talking to you about some terrible things that are going to uh, be happening on the earth. By the way, the candlestick's here in heaven with me. So that's kind of comforting, I think. So I may be wrong. Uh, you know, if it happens, I'll go, well, okay. Because you don't know there's a 30-minute 30 30 silence in heaven. Yeah. The Bible teaches that there's a 30-minute silence, and that's for all of us to get our teaching lined up with what really happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to go back and retract all the things that didn't line up and say, okay, got it now. All right, but I... <laughs> But I want to talk to you tonight about this one church in particular, and we probably have most of it, the Laodicean church. And, and, and uh, let's just read Revelation 3, verse 13 through 16. I'm reading out of the New King James Version. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, I've always thought that was an interesting statement. Everybody knows what that means, right? He who has an ear, because you know, most everybody's got ears, but what's he saying? He's saying, hey, listen up. i got something important to say to you. And, and you know, if you go back... Back to uh, in, in Matthew and Luke where Jesus used that statement, he, and he also adds this thing to it. And he says, and to him who has, more will be given. But to him who has not, what he does have will be taken away from him. And what's he talking about? He's talking about ears to hear. So he's saying, all right, to him who has ears to hear, more will be given to him. To him who listens up when the truth is going forward, more will be given to him. But to him who doesn't listen... Even what you have will be taken away from you. And a lot of Christians go through life gaining and losing. Gaining, and it's just this break-even life. Or really, they go through life surviving instead of thriving because they don't have ears to hear. Yeah. Right? And, and, and so the first thing Jesus starts out is saying, hey, listen. And then what does he say? And listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches, not the church. Not the universal church. Listen to what the Spirit is saying through the churches, through the local churches. 
And, and, and so here we go. And he says, And to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold or hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, this message is not going to talk about being lukewarm. Because that's not what Jesus wants. What's he want? What's he want? Hot or cold. Now, that one always confused me because I thought the way I was taught, it, you know, is, is, well, Jesus, hey, Jesus said it'd be better off if you were cold than be lukewarm. Or so you're saying either be on fire for God or be totally cold with God, and Jesus thinks that's better than being lukewarm. I don't think he believes that. I think he'd rather have lukewarm than no fire at all for God. Well, so what's he talking about? Well, what he's talking about is, is you got to know a little bit about, about this city. This city had no water. It had no water supply on its own. It, the Laodiceans had, had, had to bring in water from the north and the south. And they brought in, they brought in this water. And, and from, you know, they, the Laodiceans, they brought in from, from Hierapolis, which was south of the city, they brought in hot water. Hierapolis was known for these healing springs. Hot, like Warm Springs, Georgia, all right, is known for these healing springs. And then from the, nor from the north of the city was Colosse, which Colosse was known for its cool, refreshing springs. All right, and, so the, and, they, and the way they would get it there is, if you've ever been to Israel, you've seen it. They had these aqueducts they would build that were up off the ground, and they would build aqueducts that would just run miles from city to city, and this water would be put in, and these aqueducts were built out of limestone. And they'd dump this water out of Hierapolis. They'd put this hot water into the limestone aqueducts, and they'd ship it to, it, it'd flow down to Laodicea. And then they would bring this refreshing water, these springs in, from Colossus, and they would send them down to Laodicea. That's how they got their water, because they had no water supply of their own. And so when Jesus is saying, I want you to either be, See, when the water started towards you, it was cold. And when the water over here started towards you, it was hot. But you're neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. And I spew you out of my mouth. And, and, it's, and, and to kind of give you a visual, anybody ever been working in your yard on a day like today, 90-something degrees, and a water hose has been sitting there for a while, and you're thirsty, and you run over and you turn the water hose on, and you grab it real quick, and you put it in your mouth, and what is it? It's hot and it tastes like the water hose. So what do you do to it? That's what he's saying right here. That's what he's saying. It's two. This water does not taste like the source. It tastes like the channel that's carrying it. It's neither hot nor cold and it's taken on the very nature of what's carrying it. Okay, you getting it? See what he's talking about here? And, and, and so, and see what the thing is, and what he's challenging for is they don't even recognize it anymore. They've drunk the water for so long, they don't even recognize that it tastes like limestone and that it is neither hot nor cold, it's just warm. And if we don't watch it, we don't even recognize that we've settled into a water line. And that's our water line. And that's pretty good. And yeah, we've had times where God was moving through us greater. And we've had times where God wasn't, you know. But right now, it's just kind of good. And I, and I think Jesus is challenging that and said, if you don't watch that, you'll settle in. And you won't even recognize anymore that you're neither cold nor hot. And the biggest thing I think he's getting to us is, and what does the water taste like? What's the water taste like? You know, and there's a couple of things all right, that I think we can learn from this. This city had no source of its own. And I, I think that's important to Jesus pointing that out. Because one of the things God says, is it in Jeremiah, where he says, here's a couple of things I have against you. Is that you went, that my source wasn't, wasn't good enough for you. You went and dug your own sources, and, and he says, and those sources don't even have water in them. 
and, and I think Jesus is challenging us here with this is hey because this is a this is you know the thing I love about Revelation Revelation is was written to the people then it was it was you know all prophecy is not just future all a, a biblical prophecy is about things that were to remind you that he's always been there and he'll always bring you through it's about things that are happening right now and it's about things that are to come and so this is this was applicable to the church there was a church in Laodicea he was talking to but he's also talking to the local church today. And he's talking to us as individual members of a local church. Is, are you, he said, I want you to be refreshing or healing. Just don't be good. Don't just be, well, everything's okay. Either be refreshing or be healing. But don't just be somewhere in between that. That, that in your life as an individual and as a church, are you refreshing or are you healing? Or are you doing both? And, and in your life as, as individuals, the, the only way that we remain a place where people find refreshing and a place where we find healing is remember that we have no source on our own. That He is our source. And that without Him, we have nothing to give. I mean, listen to what Jesus said about us. He said, without me, you're not even good wood for a fire. That's what he said. He said, you're not even, you're really not even fit for the fuel for the fire. But with me, you can do anything. I heard a guy say a few weeks ago, and that is so powerful. He said, hey, God never, God never asked you to be for him. God asks you to be with him. Quit working for God. The reason it's so hard is you're working for him. It's not that and for God all things are possible. It is with God all things are possible. Quit working for God and work with God. And, and, you, and that's, where the, that's where the supernatural is. is what, what's Jesus doing? Let's do that. I want to do it with you. Instead of, I'm going to do something for God, let's, do, let's, let's change that and let's start doing things with God. Can I get a better amen? Yeah. All right. And so, and so you have this, you know, this, the city has no source of its own. It, it, the water, and then the water takes on the temperature and the flavor of the aqueduct. And, and here's the thing. If we don't watch it, we present Jesus. Listen, I don't believe in atheists. Atheists say they don't believe in God. I say, well, I don't believe in atheists. <laughs> I really don't. I, don't I, just, I just, you know, and, and I, you know, tell me what God you don't believe in, and I probably don't believe in him either. Oh. Yeah. And the reason most of them is, is just they haven't seen Jesus purely presented. Yeah. He's the water of life. And, and so I think, you know, Gandhi had this statement that I think just is an, an indictment again. I think it's an indictment here that Jesus has given us about are you, be either hot or cold, be either refreshing or healing. That should be the signs of my people. That's what he's saying here. Is that you should bring refreshment wherever you go or you should bring healing wherever you go. That is, or you bring them both. But there shouldn't be that you just came, you saw, and nothing changed. The, that, you know, that there is no water line changed. That you should change the water line because you're here. It should bring refreshing. You should bring healing. And Gandhi said, Gandhi said, if it weren't for the followers of Christ, I'd probably be a Christian. And I think there's a lot of people out there that, that we have flavored Jesus and presented to them a, a Jesus that, bear, that, that carries our flavor. We said it this morning, Jesus didn't save me to make me better. And that's not what salvation, he didn't save you to make you a better version of you. Uh, Jesus saved me so I can be Christ-like. Saved me so I can be Christ-like. Not, I'm, I'm not a remodeling project for Jesus. He, you know, salvation is you died. And everything now is new. Okay? And, and so, so what flavor? 
And see, and then we get so desensitized to it. And you got to watch this. We do it at work. We'll start flavoring Jesus with our flavor. And, and, and next thing you know, we call it theology. That's what all theology is, is our, our spin on God. And let's just let Jesus. Jesus is this remarkable product. If we just get out of the way, he'll sell himself pretty good. Yeah. Okay. And he, he, proved, he proved he's irresistible. He proved, it, he proved it on the road to Damascus. He proved, see, because there was nobody there but him. You know, he knocked Paul, he knocked Saul off that horse so hard he knocked the P off, S off of his name and put a P on it, you know. <laughs> okay. And I want you to get this. So if God wanted, if God just if God just showed up without human conduit, he's irresistible. He's irresistible. But yet he chooses to work through us. Which, which means he, that we have to say, you know what, then how am I flavoring Jesus? How am I flavoring Jesus so that the people that I have influence over, how are they resisting Jesus? Then it must be the way I'm, I'm, they're not being presented the irresistible Jesus. Jesus, show me how to be more refreshing. Jesus, show me how to walk in more healing. And where do you find that? What the Spirit's saying to the church is where do you find it? You find that in a lifestyle of worship. A lifestyle of worship. And worship isn't just the part that's set to the music. No, a worship lifestyle says do everything you do as unto the Lord. Paul in Corinthians, he goes a little further with it and he says that when you show up late, you are compromising. He says everything is thrown into question about your representation of God when you're not even punctual. I mean, go read the message translation. He says, when you decide you can't be on your post today, he said, then everything, oh, then everything you're doing with God is thrown into question. He said, it's when we stay on our post day after day, unswervingly, when, we're, when we show up on time instead of showing up late, that when we do everything we do in excellence, he said, then that validates the person of God. Validate, and it's refreshing to people. Listen, you've been in places where someone served you with excellence. It's refreshing. Yeah. It's healing. It's wonderful because, because you're thinking nobody does any customer service anymore, and then all of a sudden you run into somebody, and they heal that perception. There is somebody that does. Okay? That's all Jesus is asking us to do is, hey, live your life as an act of worship to God. You know, we used to have this saying, well, that's good enough. Well, the Bible says it's not. The Bible says, do everything as unto the Lord. And I think Jesus is challenging the Laodiceans who had no water source. And here's the thing. We got all kind of water sources. And we're talking about where's your water line going beyond your water line. And what I want to challenge you with tonight is, hey, have I settled with being this much refreshing and this much healing? There's more. And so how do we how do we stay refreshing and how do we walk in that? Because you know, Jesus' desire for us is that we're a place of refreshing and a place of healing. Yes. And the purpose, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit's ministry here on earth? Is to reproduce the supernatural ministry of Jesus in every believer. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit's ministry. That's why he's here. It's to reproduce the, the supernatural ministry of Jesus in every believer. All right, so how do we walk in that? And, and listen, what kind of exciting adventurous life would it be if we were always looking for ways to refresh and ways to heal instead of ways to survive? Just make it through today. Well, I'm just going to tell you something. If I run into you today and you're just trying to make it through today, I'm probably not going to get refreshed. And I'm probably going to think you need to get healed. <laughs> Amen? Amen. And, and see, if we don't watch it, the, the, if these things begin to settle into us and we just accept it as, you know what we do? We go into comparison mode. Well, I may not be as fired up as Pastor Chad, but I'm more fired up than this person behind me. 
<laughs> it's comparison. And comparison is just this deadly thing. And, and, and you know, God's going to, God's not, you're not going to stand there between Pastor Chad and the person behind you. You're going to stand between God with God one on one, face to face, when He says, Now, what'd you do with what I gave you? Were you refreshing? Were you healing? Or were you lukewarm? And then He's going to say, Now, you know what that lukewarm stuff does to me? <laughs> Makes, makes me violently ill. <laughs> and so I just think, you know, every day we ought to ask, hey, today, Lord, make me a place of refreshment. Who am I going to refresh today? I, I, it's a great adventure when you do it. It really is. As you're on the lookout for somebody that needs refreshment. You just, you're going through, and, and you go through the grocery store line, and you say, Lord, today, who am I going to be a place of healing for? And, and it's amazing how many doors we don't see because we're lukewarm. But then when we just simply say, today, I'm going to be on the lookout for somebody that needs refreshing. And how all of a sudden you just see them everywhere. You just need some refreshing, don't you? You just look a little worn down. Hey, I just want to pray for you right now. I just want you to tell you, man, it's going to be a great day. Look at you. You're up. You're about, you know. Or you go through the grocery store, and, and the first thing you know is you say to somebody, how are you doing today? And they say, Phew, I feel horrible today. I think, I'm, I think there's something wrong with me. And lukewarm goes, oh, I'm sorry. And you go on about our business. And we don't even realize we've settled into that place. But oh, the person on the hunt for adventure, they're going, you... You feel bad? I've been waiting for somebody that feels bad. <laughs> I've been waiting. These hands, these hands have been looking for somebody to lay on today and believe God for healing. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I'm going to pray for you. Is that okay if I pray for you? You know, and, and, and very few people will tell you no. Very few people will tell you no. You're sick, man. And I, I just tell you, I'm a Christian, I, and I believe if I lay hands on you, God will heal you. I believe you'll start feeling better immediately. I'm going to pray for you right now, right here in this grocery store line. Is that all right with you? And life just becomes this great adventure. It really does. Instead of lukewarm, because you know what? When we settle in a lukewarm, life becomes all about us. And we flavor, and the water tastes like us. And you walk out of that grocery store, you just laid hands on somebody, and the people behind you, they're going, I mean, look, here's what they're going to do. They may go, bunch of holy rollers in here today. <laughs> they may say that. Or they may go, wow, wonder why I don't do that. Come on, I'm a believer. I, Come on. I, Come on. I'm a believer. Why don't I do that? And the person you're laying hands on might actually get healed. I remember, I remember the first time we laid hands on somebody. We were, Cheryl and I were teachers and we were in a, and, and uh, teaching fourth grade and his mom came up to us and she said, hey, I, uh, this, I can't remember his name, but she said, hey, uh, he's running a fever, and, and uh, we're going we're to take him home. We're not going to. I said, okay, before you take him home, can we pray for him? Can we lay hands on him? We've never done that, and we'd like to do that. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we did. You've got to start somewhere. And, and, we, and we said, okay. she said, sure. I mean, we were a charismatic church. We're in church. <laughs> You know, she, we were thinking, how come we haven't been doing this? You know? And so we said, all right. Father, we reached over and put my hand on him. And Cheryl put her hand over him and said, Father, in the name of Jesus, healing be. And his fever left. I'm not talking about something. I thought it did. I said, hey, Mom, put the mama, you know, the, the mama thermometer on her, you know. <laughs> you know, where they lean over and put their head on it. And she went, my goodness. And we both looked at her hands and said, It works. It works. And, we, and I remember we prayed and said, Father, just give us this opportunity. And my aunt, my favorite aunt, was dying of cancer. She was in, in uh, I forget what, the, what was the hospital, Emory? Emory Hospital. And, and she was not a believer. And she was, and, and they told her, you know, that she's dying. She was in a hospital to die. So we go in, and, and when we got there, it was full of family. And I thought, oh, man, I can't say, oh, I can't do this in front of people. <laughs> Me and Cheryl's just sitting there doing the casual thing, you know, and, and, and finally we just said, Rachel, you mind if we pray for you? And she said, no, I don't mind. 
And so we reached over, and, and before we, no, no, that's out of our order. First thing we did, I said, Rachel, now all my aunts and uncles are sitting in there, and they were crazy bunch. Listen, <laughs> I mean, the Ashmores are the most dysfunctional people. I mean, really, I mean, it, it's, Ash, you go look up dysfunction in the dictionary, Ashmore, pictures of my family. <laughs> You go to an Ashmore family reunion, and if we didn't have a fight, everybody thought it was a failure as a family reunion. <laughs> and, and I mean, my 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 dad had was a, was five brothers and sisters, and my mom was three. And I want you to get this: out of all my aunts and uncles, out of all my grandparents, out of all my siblings, and out of all my cousins, I was the only sober person in our family tree. I'm telling you, it's true. It's a crazy bunch. Now, my sister's sober now and straight and loving God. And my brother is in heaven now. Uh, he died about a year ago, but he gave his life to Jesus before he died. And, but uh, So we said to Rachel, do you know Jesus? Is he your Lord? If you die, when you die, are you going to heaven? And she goes, no. Would you like to? Yes. <laughs> Holy. <laughs> this is so she's the first person I ever led to the Lord. Wow. Yeah. And it was just this this thing of deciding every day I'm gonna be refreshing or healing. We just uh, and, and we led her to the Lord and then we said, Okay, now now Jesus also heals. Can we lay hands on you? We laid hands on her and prayed for her, and she came out of the hospital. Went to, and was a Sunday school teacher at Mount Perrin Church of God in Atlanta for 12 years. And so when I did her funeral, when I did her funeral, I did the funeral for a saint. Come on. You know, and it was just, it was so much better way to do a funeral. But Jesus' challenge there is, hey, stay a place of refreshing. Stay a place of healing. And, you know, and, and it's just, I think, and y'all can come back up here, whatever you're going to do. The, uh, and I can give you 16 steps to stay in refreshing and stay in healing. But I think there's one. And I think that's just live in his presence. Just the first and foremost, you're not going to stay refreshing and you're not going to stay healing when you stay away from his presence and not just on a Friday night at a special meeting at Torrent and a wonderful listen to a talented and wonderful team leading us in anointed songs but when all hell's breaking loose in your house and on your job and in your business that you determine I'm going to stay close to his presence and and, and there's a couple of things that that requires. If you want to put out a fire, say I've got four or five oak logs on a fire and it's burning really good, tell me, how you, tell me some ways you can put that fire out. You can drown it, drown the fire, smother the fire. A, 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 another way you can put the fire out, if you don't have any water or anything to smother it with and you've got five oak logs together burning, just separate them. Separate them, and and they'll go out. Now you got you got a, you got a place where you got five oak logs that have been separated and they're kind of smoldering, and you don't have anything to start them back up with. How can you get them back going? Put them back together. Put them back together. I, heard, I read a story one time about a pastor in a little town. He came in and. And, and he was doing that thing, you know, of where everybody's at that says they're members of the church. And he went and visited this one guy. And it was a cold day, and the guy had a big fire going. And, and uh, said the guy met at the door, and the guy said, I guess you come talk to me about not coming to church. He says, no, no, I just came to have a cup of coffee with you. So they got a cup of coffee, and they're sitting there by the fire. And he said, the pastor's sitting there for a while, and they've never said a word. And he reaches over and takes the poker, and he takes the logs and begins moving the logs away from each other and the fire just begins to go down and right before it goes all the way out he takes the poker and pushes the logs back together and the fire comes back up he finishes his coffee and the guy looks at him and says see you at church Sunday see you because we need each other 
and, and we need to be surrounded by people who are on fire. And if you don't watch it, as on fire as you are, as on fire as you are, you know, there's, a, there's a place in Louisiana you don't want to go. It's called By You Self. And you don't want to go there. Because by yourself is a, is a bad place to be. And, and tonight, you're surrounded by a bunch of people. There's a bunch of, bunch of kindling wood in here right now. All right? And, and I want you to get real honest with Jesus. Where are you at on the refreshing or the healing scale? What's the water taste like that's flowing from you? Does it taste like doubt and unbelief because my dear Aunt Sally, who was the godliest person I knew, she died sick and God didn't heal her, so he must not heal anymore. So now Jesus tastes like that. Does it taste like, does it taste like offense because somebody let you down and some pastor, or, you know, listen, you know what the church, you know what the definition of a local church is? It's a bunch of imperfect people following imperfect leaders, pursuing a perfect vision. Yeah. Cheryl and I found a church one time. We got lost in Atlanta because they had changed all the roads. And we found a church one time and we pulled up. And we're sitting there. We didn't know where to go. And right in front of us, there's a church called the Perfect Church. I said, There it is, Cheryl. We found the Perfect Church. <laughs> it was completely boarded up. And I, I thought, you know what, the only way that can be a perfect church is if no human being ever walks in it. Because the moment one of us walk in, well, I'm going to church because there's hypocrites there. Well, we are. We're here. You're right here with us. You big old dirty hypocrite. Okay. And we're a bunch of imperfect people. And we follow imperfect leaders. And some of us have flavored Jesus based on our hurt from some imperfection, imperfect person. And we flavor the way we represent church to people. And there's no wonder they won't go to church. I wouldn't go there either. And we flavored His bride with our flavoring. Some of us, have, have, because of our disappointments, we flavored Jesus with our disappointments. And I just think tonight would be a good time to tell Jesus... I am sorry for making you taste like me. I am sorry that you taste like the water hose. And I want to deliver a pure, clean, refreshing, healing Jesus to everybody. I'm sorry for the way I've represented you to my spouse. I'm sorry for the way I've represented you to my children. I, am, I want to apologize to you, Jesus, for the way I've represented you to my boss. That when he says we've got a 10-minute break, and I'm always taking 15 minutes, and I apologize to you, Jesus, for representing you as someone who would take advantage like that. I want to apologize to you, Jesus, for the way I've treated my employees and the way I've represented you to my employees. I want to apologize to you, Jesus, as for, for the way that I've pastored and represented you sometimes when people were letting me down. I want to apologize to you, Jesus, for the way I've treated my pastors when they let me down. I want to apologize to you for flavoring the water where it doesn't taste like you, where it tastes like me. Forgive me, Lord, for the times in my life or out of anger, or out of pain, or out of betrayal, or out of rejection, or out of just selfishness. I presented you in a way that caused others to see you as less than refreshing, or less than healing. Why don't we stand up, and maybe you need to tell him that. Maybe you need to just find that place with him. Maybe that place is up here, kneeled down before him. Maybe that place is some private place, but as our worship team just leads us, I think maybe we ought to just have a little one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and saying, hey, I, I don't want to be something you vomit out of your mouth. I want to be something that people desire. I want to be a place where the living water flows.
stars in the night sky cannot out to you the moon and the darkness cannot shine as bright all kings and their kingdoms all the earth and its splendor can't cast a shadow to you and your light to you and your light see that again this time stars in the night sky cannot out to you the moon in the darkness cannot shine as bright all kings in the kingdoms oh the earth in its splendor can cast a shadow to you and your life but to you
Got it. I want to read you this verse because anytime you hear something like that, then you, what what we do as humans, we have, we set about saying, okay, now how am I going to do that? How am I going to be a place of refreshing? How am I going to be? Listen to Psalm 104, verse 4. The voice translation says, You make your messengers like the winds, like the breeze that whispers your words. Your servants are like the fire and the flame. Who does it? You make your messengers like the winds, like the breeze that whispers your words. You make your servants like the fire and the flame. This isn't some works project. Yeah. This is just a submission project. This is just, hey, here I am. I love this perfect song. You know, it's, hey, you make me glorious. You make me glorious. You are his favorite. He thinks you're amazing. You are, the Bible calls you the apple of his eye. The pearl of great price that a lot of people have, have put that story with is, is that's Jesus. If you go look at it, that's really us. You know, he went, Jesus went and bought the whole field to buy you. To get the pearl of great price. You are glorious. You are his messenger and your, your when you speak, he'll make your whispers like the refreshing wind and he'll make your fire and your flame come out and bring warmth and healing that's what he does when we just come before him and say here I am here I am and just let him let him point out the places where we're starting to flavor the water let him point out I used to think the secret place was like this Every day, you know, it says every day you find him in the secret place. And I used to think it was this place I had to go find him. I believe the secret place is named that because it's the place where my secrets are revealed. It's where it's the only place I can go to where he can say, hey, Tony, you got this going on. And I want to expose it. And it's safe because I'm your daddy and I love you. And I'm going to expose it for your good in the secret place. I love the secret place because I go to him and go, what is it? Is it which psalmist is it? It says, if you see anything here that you don't like. If you see anything here that you don't like, that's the secret place. Hey, Lord, I'm here in your presence. That's so glorious. You see anything here you don't like? Is there anything here that's flavoring the water? Oh, show it to me, because man, I want to be a place of refreshing today. I, when I whisper, I want I want it to be refreshing to people. Lord, I want I want to be a flame of your fire that heals wherever I go. Lord, show me anything in here. And I just wanted to encourage you in that. Is that's who you are? This song's right. He makes you glorious. Don't go on to some works project. Okay, that's what I love about repentance. Repentance is a joyful lifestyle. So if you could just remain standing for a moment, I'm going to ask Pastor Tony and Pastor Cheryl to come and pray a blessing over our house, pray a blessing, and just to speak um, a blessing over us as we venture, because we're, we're about to take a great adventure, amen? And, uh, you know, I don't know if they will be back before they come to help us celebrate the grand opening. I don't know. We'll see. It's according to how quick we can do that, right? According to how quick God moves. And so I've asked them, if you guys would just step up here, and, and uh, baby, will you come up here with me? And, I'm going to ask them just to pray. So you remember, you just get your hands out like you're going to receive a gift. And God's going to release something to you. Before we pray, I feel like God started speaking to me last night about this church. And, and I felt like he was saying, he's well pleased. He's well pleased with these two leaders. He's well pleased with the leadership team. And he's well pleased with where this church is right now. But don't settle in with what you've got. I felt like God said he wants BC2 and he wants the members individually to be these places of healing. And that this is supposed to be a place of healing. And I felt specifically like he said racial reconciliation. I felt like he said a place where people who feel unwanted and rejected won't be afraid to walk in the door. And that's going to start in your prayer closet. And it doesn't matter if you look around right now and it doesn't look like, hey, 
this is a place where racial barriers have been broken down. You begin to declare that, and you begin to believe it. When we started our church in Villa Rica, that we knew God called us to be a place where it was just totally diverse. And we just kept saying that and believing it and praying it. And when you walk in today, you'll just see almost every ethnic group that you can think of represented. But it didn't happen overnight. It happened first in a prayer closet. And then it began to happen as we, as we declared it together. But God says it's so important that you don't lose sight of that, that he wants people to be able to look at this place as a model of what churches are supposed to be like all over the country. And he wants to begin to hear in this city with you. And he wants people to understand that this is a place of love. And this is a place of no judgment. That we can come in with whatever our baggage may be and you're going to embrace me. That I can walk in that door and feel like I'm the chief of all sinners, but I've come to the right place. And he said that as great as it is right now, you haven't seen this much of it. And it's not just numerical growth. It's the growth he wants to do on the inside of each and every one of you. Your intimacy with him and the wisdom you're going to walk in and the wisdom that these two are going to walk in. And how important it is for you to be Aaron and hers and hold these arms up and pray for them and support them and follow the vision that God's placed in their heart because it's a vision not only for you, but a vision for the whole city and for the whole region. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. We thank you that you're a God of love and that you're a God who cares about every single detail in this church and in these lives. And that you're not a God who just throws it out there and walks away. But where there's a vision, you're equipping, you're preparing, you're our forward guard, you're our rear guard. And God, I thank you that every VC tour is going to attach to this vision, that they're going to attach to their pastors, and they're going to be excited about where you're going. They're going to be excited about following you and about following their pastors as their pastors go after the vision. And in the Bible where Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, that this is not going to be a church afraid to say, we trust our pastors, we trust our Lord, and the best we can, we're going to imitate them as they follow Christ. And we're going somewhere important. And we're going to be breakers, and we're going to break down barriers. And people are going to be able to look at this church and say, God is truly at work, and that he really is a God of love, and that he really is a God of reconciliation. Can you imagine a place like that? We never thought we would see it. We've got it in our own city. A place where there's radical love just thrown out there for everybody. That it's not a place of judgment. That it's a place of healing. And a place where we can find wholeness. And a place where we can learn how to walk in a sound mind. Where we can find healing for our bodies and healing for our spirits. Father, I thank you that you're taking us beyond our water lines. That we're not even going to look back. We don't care what the old water line is. We want to go towards the new one. Father, we do it with excitement and we do it with zeal and we do it with great passion and we do it with great love because we know who we serve and we know what an awesome, almighty God you are. Thank you for great healing. Thank you that in these three days there's been great freedom. I thank you that not one person is going to leave unchanged that chose to enter in to your presence, that chose to enter into worship, that chose to have ears to hear that more will be given. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Which, which direction is the property? I, I'm directionally challenged in a building. Everybody, everybody face that way. Stretch out your hand there. Okay, and let's call from the north, the south, the east, and the west, the people God wants here. Okay? Lord, we just, we just call from the north, the south, the east, the west. We call in people, Lord, from all around to come and populate the property, Lord, to come and just become this tribe, Lord. And we just thank you, Lord, that this will be a tribe, that it's a safe place, Lord, that, it's a, that, Lord, that other churches will look to this tribe for safety. And Lord, I thank you that this will be a place where a community gathers, that it is going to destroy bad misconceptions of the church, Lord. I thank you, Lord, it's going to paint a new image of your glorious church among the people. And the people are going to say, hey, the Lord, we take back that third space, that we that outside of our home, outside of our work, that this will be a place people say, hey, let's go hang out there. Let's go hang out there. Lord, I thank you 
We thank you that that property is paid for, that you already have the plans and the building that you want there. I think you make it clear to the team here. And, Lord, that the finances come quickly in Jesus' name. Even so, Lord, come quickly. And we thank you. It'll be a glory to your name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining us for this year's Torrent Conference. If you enjoyed this, find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at BC2Online and subscribe to our YouTube channel.